is start to go on. Okay, yeah. And once, we're, once you're going off... Green lights when it's on. Okay, that's and on. If you stop, okay. I can yeah. help you. Yeah, yeah.
Good evening, everyone. Can I call you to, to order and we'll, we'll get underway once we've, we've settled down. Well, a very warm welcome to Birmingham Cathedral, both in person and, as we always say, now on the live stream as well. It's great to have people able to join us from their homes. Welcome to um, our first annual Bishop Gore Lecture on Christian Social Theology. Um, I'm really excited. We've, we've got a, a great speaker. We've got John Parambalath, who's Bishop of Bradwell, um, somebody who's got huge urban experience and a keen lens to think about Anglicanism and its engagement with the world. Um, some of us here have already benefited from Bishop John's wisdom today in a gathering of urban clergy slightly earlier, so I'm very excited to hear more this evening. Um, just before we begin, um, a couple of notices. If you need the toilet, it's over there. This is my um, air hostess bit, isn't it? If you need the toilet, it's over there. If the fire alarm goes, please leave, and there are exits, those corners and those corners. So find your way to, to, to one of those. Um, an apology from, from Dean Matt. He's having to isolate, I'm afraid, so keep him in, in prayers. He, I think he's watching on the live stream, so uh, hello, Matt. Um, John will speak for a bit, and then there'll be time for conversation and questions. Um, not quite sure how, we, how long we'll go on for. It depends on how much energy we've got, but I promise you we'll finish by 9 o'clock at the latest so we can get home. So... Welcome to Bishop John Parambalath. I must say nine o'clock is the latest, okay? <laughs> I'm indeed privileged to be delivering this first annual lecture named after Bishop Charles Gore. Those who visit this cathedral will not miss the statue of Bishop Gore blessing the city. Birmingham does not have a big cathedral because Bishop Gore did not want to spend a vast amount of money to build a cathedral. He was convinced that such money should be spent on serving the poor in Birmingham not building another monument. Gore was involved in the work of Christian Social Union, founded in 1889, dedicated to the study of contemporary social conditions and the remedying of poverty and other forms of social injustice through public mobilization to alleviate the same. So it is fitting that we explore tonight that particular tradition where Charles Gore stood, the socialist tradition in the Church of England. I will trace the movement in four different stages. I must say I am indebted to John Orrance for a greater part of that history and the historical details there. The first stage, I will say, is Oxford movement, the Tractarians, beginning of a social movement. On 14th July, 1833, when John Keeble accused the English state of apostasy, from the pulpit of Oxford University Church of St. Mary the Virgin. He wasn't a revolutionary at all. John Henry Newman insisted several times that their enemy was liberalism. They were conservative. Yet the Tractarians grasped what many old-fashioned Tory Anglicans could not understand that the church needs to free itself from the crown in order to minister to the nation. For them, church's problem was identification 
of status with sanctity. They poured contempt on the gentleman heresy, the notion that the priest's vocation was to be respectable and authoritarian. Harold Froud spoke about Papyrus Christi, the identification of the church with the poor was never even political there. But it had radical implications, for it challenged the conventional understanding of both the priesthood and the poor. Edward Pusey argued that the poor had a sacramental dignity, every bit as profound as that of the priest who visited them. The poor were the visible representatives to the rich of God's only begotten son. Given how the Tractarians were re-envisioning the relations between Christ, the church, and the poor, some of their questions unintentionally challenged the social order as well. And then what I would call the second stage, from universities to the slums. So all this was happening in the university. They were all scholars in the university. It was when the Catholic movement left the universities and entered the slums. The radicalism or the radicalism so often implied became explicit. Most Anglo-Catholic clergy did not go to the slums out of their own will. Some were led by the Spirit to minister to the people in the margins. Others were forced. Their bishops did not trust them, parishes did not want them, and so they had to go and work where no one else would. But when they were confronted with the dehumanizing conditions in which their parishioners lived, most of them could not just hold on to preaching the promise of the next world. Their churches became centers of social mission. They established schools and initiated various social projects. Some went further. They started challenging those who were exploiting the poor. They also developed ritualism. The Oxford Fathers were deeply sacramental, but they did not develop all the Catholic rituals. But in the slums, as the next generation reached out to their people, their arguments took on a radical cast. Even John Henry Newman, when he was still an Anglican, he celebrated Eucharist with cassock and surplice. All the other things came later on, because in the slums, these priests who were championing the cause of the poor believed in a religion of the senses, a religion of music and symbol, of light and hope, a religion of the oppressed. Worship, liturgy, and rituals became tools of resistance and solidarity. Although the slum ritualists forged a powerful bond between worship and resistance, they did not have a social theology to sustain their labors. They were very practical in giving help, but they didn't have the theology to sustain them in their ministry because they had learned their faith from the Tractarians. And the Tractarians often lost sight of God's sacramental presence in the world while defending the church's sacraments. At the heart of it, it was still 
a conservative theology. Their Catholicism itself would have to be liberated before they could talk about liberating the world. And that's where I would consider the third stage in that development. It was Stuart Hedlum and the Guild of St. Matthew. It was Stuart Hedlum who began to give shape to a social theology and vision. Hedlum was not a disciple of the Tractarians at all, but of the Christian socialist theologian F.D. Morris, from whom Hedlum picked up three affirmations. One, God redeemed the whole human race and the whole of human nature. God redeemed the whole human race, not just a few individuals, and the whole of human nature. Two, salvation is a social reality. Three, the kingdom of God is as earthly as it is heavenly. So it was those three affirmations that he took over from F.D. Morris that became the foundation for Hetlam's theological exercise. From there, Hetlam developed a theology that was both sacramental and social. He championed the doctrine of baptismal regeneration, but insisted that it was more than a promise of the otherworldly life. It is the foundation of a just society. Baptismal regeneration makes us inclusive and democratic. A clergyman, quoting from him, by the mere fact of baptizing the laborer's little baby, was bearing witness to the truths of equality in a more far-reaching way than any French Revolution did. So he found a radical act of solidarity in the priestly ministry of even baptizing a laborer's baby. Hetlam found the same revolutionary truths set forth in the Holy Eucharist too. He complained that many Anglo-Catholics did not understand that the Christ whose presence they adored is Jesus of Nazareth, the poor Jewish carpenter who befriended the outcast and challenged the rich. Christ chose the simple elements of strength and joy, which is bread and wine, to share his presence, reminding us that in taking our flesh upon himself, God sanctified our earthly needs, our earthly comradeship, and our earthly delights. God sanctified our earthly needs, our earthly comradeship, and our earthly delights. It was this sacramental vision, rather than any political agenda, that led Hedlam to summon all Christians to build a world based on the principles of democracy and equality. Hetlam's vision was also one of joy. Hetlam believed that the incarnation hallowed earthly pleasure. And so he championed the people's right to art, music, and even to drink. He spoke about the delights of the ballet to the dismay of most churchgoers who complained about the ballerina's flesh-colored tights. An angry man once asked him if St. Paul would have gone to a music hall. And Hedlam responded, I do not know if St. Paul would have gone, but I know that our Lord would have gone and taken his blessed mother with him. 
he was not talking about any kind of moral licensing he was emphasizing the fact that god becoming man or human implies our human needs are also sanctified hetlam gathered a small group of clergy and lay people to form the guild of saint matthew some of them would make significant contributions of their own to the development of sacramental socialism one was percy demo who would later earn fame as a hymn writer and liturgical reformer frank weston the fiery bishop of sansibar was another one speaking to the anglo catholic congress in 1923 he attacked those who hid from the world behind a veil of smells and bells and challenged them to go out into the streets and find the same jesus who is present in the blessed sacrament Percy Widrington a gifted theologian among them wrote the church must challenge the industrial world as it challenged the forces of the roman imperialism in the days of persecution Conrad Nobel was another one among them in 1916 he founded catholic crusade of the servants of the most precious blood its purpose was to break break up the present world and make a new in the power of the outlaw of galilee st john's church in taxted jenny thomlinson would know very well <laughs> within the diocese of chelmsford in essex became a shrine for anglo catholic socialists who were drawn to its mix of graceful liturgy beautiful music medieval architecture and revolutionary politics an anti imperialist novel championed the cause of self determination a marriage of prayer and passion of theological reflection and eschatological dreams produced a transfigured social theology at the heart of which was a transfigured orthodoxy in 1924 the league of the kingdom of god was formed known later as the christendom group morris rickett was a leading thinker in this group who edited christendom a journal of Christian sociology from 1931 to 1950 Socialist Christian League was also formed around the same time and had a strong Anglo Catholic presence there Socialist Christian League and the Society of Socialist Clergy and Ministers founded in 1952 came to be known for its prominent thinker Stanley Evans and both those merged together to form christian socialist movement in 1960 okay so that probably brings up to a, a current organization which is still existing in some form even though there are questions whether it is socialist or not the, the fourth uh, stage is basically the recent and contemporary thinking this theological tradition continued through many recent and contemporary thinkers i would probably name trevor hudson paul moore and michael ramsey among the sort of people in the last generation they were prominent figures articulating an anglo catholic social vision kenneth leech challenged and encouraged a generation of clergy and lay people and gathered many of them in the group known as jubilee group i'm sure that andy was still actually you know part of the movement when it was sort of disbanded you no know, 
when we realized it was all centered around a person called Ken Leach, you know, and he didn't want anything like that to be around him. There have been attempts after that to revive this voice through the Church of Socialist Network and the Society of Sacramental Socialists. But all of them remained mainly as platform for mutual support of like-minded people. It is a theological movement that took scripture seriously. But scripture too was transformed even as they bore witness to the light. Anglican socialists rejected both the otherworldly reading by the biblical literalist and the moralistic approach by the liberals. Instead, they held up the Bible as the charter of redemption, as a story whose master narrative from creation to exodus, from exile to incarnation, from crucifixion to resurrection and ascension, points to the triumph of the kingdom of God on earth. As a movement, the Anglican socialist tradition met with its demise. What did really happen? It must be good to ask why that movement at some point was quite strong and dominant in raising a voice had a demise. There are several factors. The first one is that the, the whole church took the ownership of that voice. The church began to speak. Because when these early fathers were making all that noise, they were considered to be rebels in the church. It was not the church speaking. It was a few isolated group of people making a noise. But then it was not possible for the church to ignore the plight of the people. So the synods and the bishops and the mainline church took up the cause of the marginalized. Church began to speak through reports and resolutions on political and economic issues and made its voice heard in the public square. So the need for a distinctive socialist voice within the church became less compelling. Secondly, the state began to do things that was not expected. We began to celebrate the virtues of the welfare state. The partial success of the welfare state deprived Christian social criticism of its urgency. Thirdly, the Anglican social movement was weakened by its excesses. Many of these Anglican radicals did not understand economic theory and often lacked economic facts. Some blindly followed the so-called socialist models presented elsewhere in the world. For example, some were still dreaming of a Leninist revolution even when the world became fully aware of the socialist tyranny in Soviet Union. So that tendency to hold on to the, the models which failed okay, was one of the reasons why they became very unpopular. And they were always critical of the bishops, always critical of the church, so they became basically you know, angry people who couldn't really convince others through proper teaching and dialogue. Fourthly, for many of them, the vision was not broader. It was not international. A kind of nationalism came to be associated with Anglo-Catholic socialism. Nostalgia for Mary England, uh, Little England. And as you would know, you can't have socialism in one place. And that is very basic tenant of socialist understanding. You need to be international. You need to be looking at the globe, the world, not just a particular community. 
What is the future of Anglican social theology? Now we need to realize that there are other social theologies too. Okay? There is a strong Catholic social kind of theology coming from actually the Roman Catholic Church, you know, and particularly developed in the context of Latin America, uh, the liberation theology, and all that. You know? But we are just trying to see what is the relevance of the tradition we had within the Church of England, particularly for our nation and for the world. I do not need to give the reasons for having a coherent social theology and vision today. Social, political, and economic challenges, both at home and abroad, are numerous. We face a convergence of crises. Climate change, refugees, economic inequalities, you can name them. The list goes on. There is a need for reclaiming social theology, but that is not just about this particular tradition. There are many other options possibly are available too. But focusing on this particular kind of Catholic social theology, how do we reclaim or what are we reclaiming? What kind of theology is this? No? Firstly, it is a sacramental theology. Low view of sacraments leads to the laws of transcendence. Eucharist presupposes the goodness of Godward movement of creation. It is concerned with the transformation of material structures, a banquet of human liberation. Headlam. It, repres it represents Christ's sacrifice and for presence the messianic banquet. This is the basic basis for radical mission. As Frank Westman said, if you are prepared to fight for Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, then you have to get out from before your tabernacle and walk out into the streets. Look for Jesus in the ragged, naked, and the oppressed. And when you see him, gird yourself with his towel. We need a sacramental theology. And it is a social theology. Salvation is a social reality. This is not a discovery of Vatican II. Responding to the trend of personal salvation, F.D. Morris insisted that Christ delivered us from self-centeredness in order that we might live for one another. Conrad Novel researched thoroughly the Church Fathers for his left-wing quotations. Close link between Orthodox, Trinitarian, and Incarnational doctrine and the struggle for social justice and equality is well established. We need to recover the social theology. And it is a materialistic theology. There was emphasis on the materialistic nature of social reality. There needs to be a recovery of Christian materialism. Slum priests and their experience are examples of connecting ritualism to radical human action. Catholic theology is rooted in the crude materialism of incarnation and sacraments. Incarnation hallowed earthly pleasure, as we saw in Hedlam. And that's why he championed people's right to art, music, and he spoke of the delights and defended sacramental sensuality and attacked a narrow moralism imposed by the rich and the powerful on the poor. We need to recover the theology that takes matter seriously, a materialistic one. And it needs to be a humanistic theology. 
a high view of humanity needs to be recovered. Socialist Christian fathers recognized the danger of Western Augustinian tradition of viewing human beings as totally corrupt and depraved. Instead of gloomy pessimism, they upheld the glory of man as an orthodox teaching. Total depravity leads to social autism. So Irenaeus said the glory of God is human being fully alive. That is proper humanistic theology. And it is an open and inclusive theology. Anglican social theology has been emerging, was never perceived as a finished product. It was a journey from the Tractarians to the slum priest and then to serious theological reflection by later generations. The Guild of St. Matthew stressed on this inclusiveness and openness and contrasted it with restricting narrow and elitist nature of sectarianism. Lastly, it is a mystical theology. At the center of social theology is an appreciation of incarnation. Incarnation is raising of humanity to, the, to share in the life of God. In incarnation, God raises humanity to share the life of God. Any interpretation of incarnation, as in the myth of God incarnate, that explains away the mysticism or the mystical dimension is not helpful to social practice. I'll probably leave the theology part there. And if you look ahead, how do we develop an Anglican approach to social engagement? What does it mean to develop a, an Anglican approach for social engagement? First of all, that kind of approach should be based on study, detailed analysis, and expertise. Most of our fathers were activists with very limited space for reflection. They were angry people who were unable to draw others through teaching and persistence. Secondly, it has to be internationalist. Socialism in one state is not possible, as it was affirmed several times by many of them. We must resist the narrow nationalism. Many of the Anglican thinkers, social thinkers, were a bit narrow and looked for a fairer society of our dear England. And we need to move on from there. And it needs to be ecumenical and interfaith. Working with those of other traditions is essential. Many evangelical and Pentecostal churches are more socially conscious than many of our congregations or other faiths and secular socialists and atheists. Our forefathers, in some sense, worked in isolation and seclusion. We need to be ecumenical and even interfaith in our social engagement today. And then it should also recognize and use church's minority status. Most of the social thinkers fought against the exalted status of the church in the society. I think now we are almost there. <laughs> if not legally, in all practical purposes. We are a minority, we are powerless, and we are helpless, wondering about our own future. But that is a good place to be. That's where the church is supposed to be, in the edge of your seat, not feeling so comfortable. So we need to be recognizing our particular minority and weaker status today and use it as the strength in engaging with others. We must offer our gifts of imperfection, 
Our vulnerability is nothing to be hidden. Because we serve a society so vulnerable, we engage with people in need, people who are marginalized. So if the church is getting marginalized, let us thank God, we are becoming like the people we serve. And we need to recognize that particular dimension. And it must also integrate various stands of working for change. Rescue, reform, resistance, and revolution. Just to name actually four of them. Many of our socialist thinkers and fathers, Christian fathers, were not able to do this integration. They were straight away dreaming of a kind of revolution, equal and defense revolution. So we need to find ways of working for change. And we need to work from all these directions. Sometimes it is a question of rescuing. Sometimes it is a question of reforming what is already there. And often we need to be showing resistance. And then you might need a total change, a revolution. So there are all these options integrated together as part of Christian social engagement. And then it must proclaim orthodoxy or we should reclaim orthodoxy and a transforming and holistic biblical hermeneutics. If you follow the development of social theology in the Anglican tradition, none of them were liberals. They were very orthodox. I'm sure that many of you have read actually Ken Leach, no? The orthodox, sound orthodox biblical teaching. Many of them believed that being liberal would hinder the engagement. Because that kind of liberalism where the mysticism disappears, the transcendence is no longer there. You can't marry the divine with the human. And so it was essential for them to uphold orthodoxy. And we need to be sure that our efforts to reach out others would be based on a radical orthodoxy itself. And it must break the dichotomies of religious living, spiritual versus political, social versus personal, incarnational versus redemptive. We got quite a lot of dichotomies and we need to be able to break those dichotomies and make sure that we have a holistic understanding of the work of God in human lives. And I will finish with radical mysticism. That was always, from the very beginning, part of the thinking. It is a marriage of prayer, contemplation, and action. And there is still space for that. And I firmly believe, with many others, that we need to resurrect the Anglican social teaching. Because there is a kind of resurgence of Catholic social teaching, okay? and, and we all are aware of that. But nothing similar is happening within the Anglican tradition. And we have this great heritage and gift within the church, which needs to be resurrected and recovered. I'll, I'll stop there and I'll leave time for comments, not necessarily questions. You can make comments and you know, make additional thoughts. You know. I don't claim to have answers. Uh, sometimes I say my task is to help you ask questions, not to find answers. Thank you, John. So, And there's going to be our roving mic, so I'll just pass the uh, microphone across. Thank you. Any questions or comments anybody would like to kick off with? Keith. Just microphones coming so people can hear us on the live stream. Thank you very much. I like your comment regarding that the church is on the edge, because I feel very much that the church, as we see it now, is very much on the edge. And... Uh, being challenged at a very critical time 
And we've been through a very difficult time in this country throughout the world. And I think that um, what you've flagged up is very important and uh, that the church needs to be mindful very much of the disadvantage and hardship in our society that it hasn't been. Mm. My, I have been an advocate for the church to actually be disestablished, uh, like the Church of Wales, but whether it will or not, I don't know. Mm. It's, it is um, the Conservative Party at prayer, or has been called that. Whether it, it uh, is, I don't know. But, I mean, I, I do like what you'll say. Mm. And I do hope that when a church is uh, persecuted, as we have in the world still, um, normally good things come forward and be mindful that Christ in his own ministry um, was persecuted and we should uh, follow mm. in his good examples. Thank you. Um, I'm an American, as you can probably tell pretty quickly. It seems to me that the British House of Commons has done more to advance LGBT rights than the Church of England has. And I wondered if you could say something about that. And then secondly, does Dalit theology have anything to say to us in England? Thank you. Yes, I fully agree that actually there are others who do much better in doing God's work than the church does. No? Uh, that has been the story of the church. No? Uh, it's a painful truth, but God works sometimes outside the church. How did we arrive where we are today with regards to human rights? It came from outside. It's not actually the Christians who took initiative in abolishing slavery. Yes, one or two individuals were forced to do that or they got that kind of enlightenment from outside. This is where actually I have problem with when some people talk about Christian values. What are these Christian values? And where were these values? <laughs> Probably 50 years ago, okay, when there were several secular people talking about them and fighting for them and the church resisting. So I think there is, there is a question of uh, repentance for the church um, that we haven't been able to discern what God was doing in the community and in the world. And some secular movements picked up actually God's voice much before the church did. And that's our failure. We have to be taught by others. And that keeps on happening. We fall behind. And, and that's one of the things actually, you know, we need to be uh, mindful of. Where does the church stand? Um, we speak a lot about uh, being humbler and you know, wiser and simpler, but you don't become simpler and humbler by making a statement or writing a paper. There needs to be a radical conversion for the church, a radical change in the culture. And, and that's how you become actually humbler. By saying I am humble or the church is becoming humbler, you will never get there. So there is an element of repentance required from the church to say openly that we are still lagging behind and we haven't caught up with actually the work of God in the community. As Robin Williams said, actually, the mission is you know, discerning where the spirit is and joining in. And the church has to still discern where the spirit is. And for many of these occasions, I find the spirit outside the church. Okay. And the church needs to discern where the spirit is, and we need to join in. Mark, Ian, did you have your hand up as well? So, Mark and Ian, so. I was wondering um, what 
you feel the place of church schools might be in social theology, it seems that, that to me that that's one place where it's still dynamically active, is promoting flourishing life in communities, regardless of people's faith or allegiance to the Christian community. And mm. do, do, you, do you see that, something similar there? Yes, I do see actually our educational kind of mission as a serious effort, but sometimes I question that kind of flourishing that is implied. Where uh, it is not really open to the whole of the community, okay? It's sort of not, it's catering to the interest of the church-going children, okay? The majority of the seats are allocated actually to the church-going children. Um, you are not actually, originally the education was meant for the parish. When a school was established, it was meant for the parish. And I would like actually every Church of England school to follow the admission criteria of the local authority so that everyone is able to go to that school. Okay. Not by actually church attendance. And that's actually a Christian mission. Okay. Yeah, so I, I do agree that actually our presence through schools uh, is, a, is necessary and a wonderful engagement with the community. But I sometimes question part of uh, what is going on uh, because we need to change. We are not really caring for the whole community. A parish school should be caring for the whole parish. Okay? We are just becoming a kind of congregationalist kind of you know, um, understanding there. Okay? That's not what we are. We are not chaplains. The clergy are not chaplains to the congregations. Uh, for the whole parish. Now, so there needs to be something done. Personally, I feel that's the way forward. If you are serious about okay, our mission to the whole community, then everyone should have access to Christian education, uh, education in a school. May I agree with you on this church school mission in the pluralist society, particularly here in the West Midlands, where I'm chair of governors of a primary school in Smethwick, a church school. We follow that vision consistently. Yeah. But firstly, but may I just turn to the question which I recognize theologically the importance and the significance of the incarnation for the foundation of a, a Christian social order but I wondered about redemption and where the doctrine of redemption also features as a foundation stone for building a Christian ordered society and a moral ordered society because of the profound sin and need of humanity, which is both incarnational answer and redemption answer. Could you comment, please? Yes, I do agree with you, except that I don't separate them. Okay. Incarnation and redemption go together. Okay. There is redemption in incarnation, in God actually redeeming humanity and raising human uh, life to, to the level of God's life. You know, so I wouldn't separate actually incarnation from redemption. I will put them together. What's happening actually in incarnation is redemption. Redemption is not something that happens later on. And you could then bring the whole of Jesus together. You could actually put the uh, sort of resurrection, death and resurrection, and all those actually things together. But my problem is about separating these as if they are separate events. No? Incarnation itself is redemptive. Okay? If, as the church fathers considered, by incarnating, God lifted humanity okay, to experience God's life. That is redemption. Okay. So I have no, no, no dispute with you, okay, except that I wouldn't separate all of them as a kind of clear-cut kind of compartments. No? Okay, this is the doctrine of incarnate. This is the doctrine of redemption. Assam, yeah. Thank you very much for your lecture. 
I'm very interested in working for change and you use two words, you use the word rescue and resistance. Uh, during the pandemic, the churches have got very involved in rescue, particularly around food poverty. Yeah. And lots of food banks have been doing lots of good work. Mm. I'm slightly concerned that food banks are now part of the status quo. And whenever I hear mention of food banks, I want to say this should not be food banks. So can you say something about how you combine rescue and resistance and how you, how you disrupt the status quo? They should actually go together. It is not either or, no? But unfortunately, um, once we start a project uh, of rescue kind of mode, okay, we just carry on operating in that mode, no? Um, I do recognize that people will have different gifts and different kind of passion. Some of us will be uh, people of resistance. Some of us will be uh, more focused on rescuing. Uh, some will be more actually focused on a total change or revolution. Some will be working for reform. So that is fine. But as long as church as a body of Christ has got place for all the four, I would be happy. But what I'm seeing, as you say, is that we have a lot of rescue going on, okay? and we are permanently in a rescuing mode uh, without really having that voice, the prophetic voice, um, uh, to resist um, and even to reform. No? We are not sure how we can reform the current system that we have. So, yeah. So, I will be happy actually for people to focus on one of those areas because we all are different. We may have particular passion, particular gifting. Um, so, uh, one could be actually rescuing, another could be actually resisting. But within the body of Christ, as the collective body, we should have space for all those four. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not where we are. How do we get there? People like us probably have to do a little more in, uh, uh, in, in promoting uh, the real gospel, the full gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ that takes human being seriously. Yeah. And, 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 and that, is, that was basically the essential teaching. Uh, God saved the whole person. And if God saved the whole person, that is part of our proclamation of the gospel. You can't actually refrain from preaching a part of the gospel. So when I actually drive and I see some churches called full gospel church, I, I normally smile. Okay? Yes, I want full gospel, no? Because we don't preach the full gospel. Okay? We are comfortable with prosperity gospel in one part of the church and we are happy to preach a kind of liberal gospel without any kind of uh, transcendence in it, no? It becomes more like a political ideology. You don't need to be a Christian, you just need to be a Marxist then to do that, no? Um, so we, we are in a kind of situation, we are very polarized even within the church. Okay? So you've got some people passionate about rescuing, I don't know, so regardless of your church tradition, you're evangelical or Catholic or liberal, you can do rescue. So uh, food banks in almost every kind of corner of, of the land now, and mostly led by churches. Uh, but the pandemic has opened up the cracks in our society. And, and we are seeing that kind of gap between actually the, the rich and the poor sort of widening. And there is a prophetic task for the church. And I do not think we are faithful in our mission. We haven't got there. I, I was thinking about Stuart Headlam uh, yeah. last week when I was at the Rep Theatre yeah. around the corner seeing uh, East is East on its opening night and thinking how transformative an experience that was for me, you know, seeing that play and for the people who were gathered there and, you know, Headlam saying that the theatre and drama are as much part of the sacramental tapestry as, you know, the Eucharist and the gathered church. And it also had a slightly bitter note for me because I thought, well, uh, the liturgy that I preside over and celebrate in, in my parish, if I, if I sort of put my hand on my heart, it's not transformative, I don't think, for my community in the way that that play was <laughs> that night. Uh, and one of the strengths of uh, the, the 
like you mentioned the ritualists and the slum priests about marrying um, the senses and art and music and, and people's literature and poetry and drama to the gospel and to that social vision. And it, it just seems that we're so far away from that in the 21st century that we haven't found a voice for transformative Christian media, mm. whether that's art, poetry, music, drama, um, and how do we get? How do we reclaim some of that vision? Because you know, th there's a lot of. I'm sorry, I'm just going on and on now. Th th there's a lot of um, talk about evangelism as very sort of strategy driven, and that there's there is work out there to make new disciples. But we haven't found. Sh surely, great evangelistic movements come with mm. song. And, and natural hymns of praise and art and all of that. And we, we're not there, are we? So how, how do we get back? <laughs> and even evangelism, it's quite an interesting thing. We had the decade of evangelism. Probably you know the story. It actually changed in the middle of the course. Okay? It was intended to be evangelization in the sense of engaging with everyone partnering with everyone. Okay? It was the holistic understanding of the gospel that was to be proclaimed. But then halfway through, it became a one-sided thing. Okay? So I'm very happy to talk about evangelism. And I am an evangelist myself. No? I'm very proud of that. I, I proclaim the gospel in word and deed wherever I can. Um, and my understanding of evangelism, probably the evangelization as in the Roman Catholic sort of understanding is much more probably fuller. Okay? Because evangelization is not just about actually, you know, evangelism as we understand, just actually, you know, proclaiming the gospel in word and sort of receiving a kind of response. No? Evangelization is much more broader in the way that you engage with gospel with people, and it could even be structures, not necessarily just individuals, no? communities and structures and organizations. No? And, and that was the intention of the decade of evangelism. So it's our fault, actually, you know, so that you know, we set out to do something, then halfway through, we change the track, and we limit ourselves to a particular aspect of you know, uh, that wider mission. And then we distance people because they don't want to hear that kind of preaching. You don't need to preach at them. No, you don't need to preach at us, no. Okay. We would rather be happy to listen okay, when we engage. The whole question was of engagement. The Decade of Evangelism was about engagement, actually, with the wider world and the community. Okay. And the moment it was narrowed down to sort of, you know, a narrow understanding of evangelism, it failed. And maybe we need to recover that kind of vision for evangelism. Okay. We will proclaim the whole gospel. So even what we call the social kind of theology become part of our gospel. It is gospel itself. You know? It's not a kind of additional stuff that we want to bring in. And, and, the, and the whole question of actually... Uh, um, uh, pleasure and joy, you know, that you mentioned, even in Thaxted, because Thaxted, um, uh, St. John's Church, was very famous for actually Morris dancing, okay? So, liturgy, celebrate liturgy, and also you dance, you know, the procession. Recently, I was there, actually, for a service. Uh, it was the agricultural kind of service they hold every year. So, I was there last year for that. And, and we had Morris dancing within the service, and that's what they used to do there. Okay? Even the church was sort of reordered you know, in some way for people to be able to dance. Okay? Bring joy into it. Let us celebrate the gospel. Let us celebrate the presence of God. Let us marry the, the joy of the gospel and the joy of God in our life with our real life situations.
Thanks. I, I was just wondering whether Andy could do a bit of Morris dancing for us. That'd be <laughs> great. I, I'm very happy to, but you might all leave straight away. <laughs> <laughs> uh... I thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop. I um, I was struck by um, something you said earlier, and I can't remember how you phrased it, but it was about giving power away, something around that, and that um, that we get engaged in transformation when we actually are self-emptying. And uh, I don't, I, I've got very rudimentary uh, knowledge about Gore and the beginnings of this diocese, but I, have, I did read something, and it was very much, this diocese started um, very much in the spirit of not seeking institutional power, not going for the big cathedral, not going for the big bishop's mm -hmm. lodge, you know, he, he turned down a bigger offer in order to be Bishop of Birmingham. And, and very much that sense of it, we are strongest when we're giving ourselves away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the kenosis, the kenotic way of being. And I just wondered if you could reflect a bit more on um, how that could happen now and how that could bring life in the way we engage in the world. Yeah, uh, personally speaking, I would like to see the center of the church is the parish. Okay, we have this talk always about the center, no? And, and center is somewhere. Okay? And then actually, you know, there are some parishes all around, 10,000 plus parishes, no? And they all are looking towards the center, or the center is talking. We need to probably turn that around. The center of the Church of England is the parishes. And the job of a bishop is actually to enable the parishes to minister. And, and, and we, got, we got actually some of those things, those things wrong. Okay? And we expect actually every diocesan bishop to be an institutional messiah and a strategic guru who can talk actually some management kind of theories, no? So we need to know what exactly is the mission of Christ. And if the mission of Christ is about engaging with people in their real needs and engaging with the communities there, a strategy of actually establishing certain things will not work unless you mobilize these people who are on the ground. So, so the mission, the task of the, the national church, including the bishops, would be mobilizing the people who are on the ground. That means the congregations and the clergy. And that will probably make a change because you know, it might even look like a different kind of organization. I have some ideas, but actually I'm not offering those now. I'm not in the limelight for offering ideas, no. I seem to have different ideas, okay, which are not, not actually the, the, the probably the, uh, the accepted ones for the time being. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we will still be here. The churches will be declining. And we will have less engagement with people, less work on the ground, more work on actually the strategies. Yes, I believe in strategy. I have mission plans for each deanery. And we work actually and we enable the parishes. That's what actually we need to be doing. So the focus is on the community. The church is a community. And we need to behave like a community, which, which is actually very different from an institution. Yeah. Even power and authority in a community is different from an institution one. There is more of a relational kind of power than a positional power. And that's what we need to recover. And yes, you know, if we have to redeem the church, yeah, and if we need to remain in business, okay, to use the terminology acceptable today, okay, we need to change. And that change is not going to happen by writing strategies and sending it to actual diocese. That strategy has to actually happen there. And actually, you need to know what would it take to enable our congregations, our faithful communities, 
to engage with their own communities and how do they serve faithfully in that context. And my role as a bishop should be the role of an animator. <laughs> but that's not what is expected these days. Can I ask a final question if nobody else? Hang on, check one. Yep. Can yeah. I ask a final question if nobody else wants to, to ask one? Um, so, so we've heard that very beautiful story, I think, of, of um, that um, Anglican, largely Catholic social engagement, which Gore was part of, and many of us here would have been parts of in, 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 in different ways. I mean, I can think of my own family story where my, my great-grandmother was saved in a physical sense from great poverty by um, one of Father Donning's curates. Mm. Um, and that's a story that kind of goes on like a river but kind of trickles and loses and perhaps it's kind of gone underground for a bit at, mm. at times. Um, I was reflecting when you were telling it or about the people who weren't present in the story so we've got a lot of great male figures haven't we in, yeah in that and we didn't hear about the the female figures because yeah. they were yeah. uh, hid, hid, hidden um we've got the contradictions within it so we've got um the fact that we're we're talking about all this in a cathedral um it might be a small cathedral but it's a cathedral mm -hmm. um we're talking about being a church on the edge in the middle of Birmingham in a cathedral. Yeah, that's, that's always fascinating, I think. Mm. Um, we've, you know, uh, we've, we've acknowledged some of the um, difficulties and faults in that tradition. So, for example, um, quite often it's inability to be open to other voices. Mm. You know, the sense that if you're not an extreme Anglo-Catholic, you're not a Christian. You know, it's yeah, almost, yeah. almost that sense. Or only, only Anglo-Catholics are interested in transformation, which certainly isn't, isn't true now, if, if, if it ever was. So with all of that story, I guess, how, how do we become animated by it so that we can pass it on mm. to other people and keep in that tradition we're all in in, in different ways? Um, how can we hear other people's stories so that we can be enriched and our story mm. becomes mm. bigger? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I, I, I focused on this particular tradition because of Charles Gore. No? Um, that's the tradition he stood firmly within. No? Uh, but today, there are other kind of... Now, that's why I, I, I said uh, engagement should be ecumenical. Um, I engage with... Uh, a uh, lot of Pentecostal uh, leaders in East London, very passionate about actually justice, and they are my allies, not actually the local Anglican congregations there, you know. So, so you need to recognize that there are, and, and, and Andy mentioned about women, yes, there were women who contributed to social, social thinking, but not, not within this tradition, because this was very much the Anglican male-led you know, tradition, you no? Know? So we need to draw from actually other traditions, and, and particularly Roman Catholic, you know, um, um, the social teaching within the Roman Catholic Church, you know, fantastic stuff actually coming out, actually, you know. There is kind of revival and kind of recovery of that social teaching. So we need to be able to draw from there. And the evangelical movement, like Lausanne movement and John Stott, you know, regardless of actually the, the theological kind of problems some may have actually with, you know, uh, a conservative kind of evangelicalism, uh, John Stott contributed immensely uh, to, to, to the whole understanding of uh, uh, social transformation and, and change, loss in movement and all. You know. um, so we need to recognize that there are other you know, uh, traditions too. There is a very strong kind of, you know, in America, uh, sort of you know, Jim Wallace and you know, um, uh, many others you know, from the evangelical um, camp you know, um, who are very much involved in um, social theology. Yeah. So we need to recognize that today there are many other traditions and that's why we need to be uh, ecumenical. Okay. We can't do this on our own. And even I would say, dare to say, the church cannot do it on our own. Okay. We need partnerships and we need to work with other agencies and you know, 
And that's how actually God works. God always partnered with actually people outside the church or outside the people of God in the Old Testament uh, to communicate things. So we need to, we, we, we need to be building those partnerships with actually others within the church, within the Church of England, and within the wider Christian community. There are other, uh, within, within the Methodist Church, there is a kind of sacramental socialist you know, kind of group. Personally, I'm aware of some of them I speak to. Um, so the social teaching is not just limited to uh, the, the Anglican socialist movement, you know. Uh, it's just that, you know, we were talking about actually Charles Goh, uh, and, and so we wanted to just trace that particular tradition and its relevance. Um, but all of us should be aware of uh, many other traditions, you know, and that's where we need to actually build bridges, um, regardless of the church tradition uh, and differences in the kind of, you know, doctrinal kind of, you know, understanding, we need to be able to work together with other churches, other Christians, no? and even beyond uh, the Christian groups, uh, fulfilling God's mission. Thank you, yeah. Bishop John. <laughs> That's been an immensely stimulated evening, so here's a very small token of thank, thank you. you. Yeah. So, um, and thank you everybody for, for coming. Um, I've just got two notices just, just to finish with. Um, we'll be doing an annual Gore lecture, so there'll be details nearer the time about the, the next one. Um, we, we do have another public theology lecture coming up in, uh, in February, so um, it will be going on the website live about now, but um, on, on Thursday, February the 3rd, in the um, evening, we've got Professor Corin Fowler, um, who's a historian at Leicester University, and Corin um, wrote the report for the National Trust examining the um, links with colonialism with their properties, which got a real kicking by the Tory right, and then the National Trust dealt with very badly. Um, so Corinne's going to be um, in conversation with us um, on sensitive history and looking at um, how we can open up all the difficult things that arise from the sensitive history of the British Empire. So you'll be very welcome to come to that. Um, we're going to um, start a special mailing list for anybody who's interested in the lectures and talks and conversations that we'll be having. So if you want to go on that, you could let Anna know on, on your way out and leave your email or um, otherwise email in and we'll, we'll let you know stuff that's happening. So it's been wonderful to have you with us. Thanks again to Bishop John and see you all soon, I hope. Could you give us a blessing to to part with. Now may the love of God surround you, the peace of God dwell in you, and the presence of God watch over you, and all the saints and angels of God grant you their fellowship, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>